Today we're going to start a new study. I've decided we're done with Philippians. Well, I didn't decide. The Lord said we were done with Philippians. And he said, you're going to study something new. And this hit me a couple weeks ago, and I kind of blew it off. And, eh, you know, I've been over it a few times. And it's part of some series that I teach repetitively. But the Lord said, no, I want you to share it on Sunday. And so it's really, to give you the right context for it, it's really a ministry training class. Okay, and the Lord has given me that kind of a ministry ever since I've been in the ministry, recognized as a minister. I've always had training opportunities. In fact, Alpha Ministries... The primary mission for Alpha Ministries is training folks. Much like what, this is why Alex fits so well with us, much like this intentional Christianity to practice what you preach. To practice what the scriptures tell us on a daily basis. To live it out. And I've always spent my majority of my time and energies on developing training materials and training folks various groups one way or another. In fact, the Church in the Woods kind of blossomed out of that training mission back in 2001 when we first got here. And we began to meet on Sundays, a small little group, and it grew into what you all know today as Church in the Woods. And so I maintained that training mission. So I, I thought, you know, this would really be an appropriate time for our, the study of the Church in the Woods. Sunday morning, the last ministry training class that Jesus gave his disciples on the night before he was crucified, before he was tacked to that cross, before he was raised from the dead, before he ascended back to the Father, he spent a little time with his disciples in the upper room observing the Jewish Passover meal. And during that time, he began an instruction. It's referred to by Bible scholars as the, quote, upper room discourse, which just simply means the words Jesus spoke to his disciples while they were in that upper room after they completed the Passover meal. And it extends, at the end of chapter 14, it doesn't quit there, it extends on to the words he spoke to them while they left that upper room, walked through the eastern gate of Jerusalem, down the hill, across the brook Kidron, and into the Garden of Gethsemane. So he was instructing them all along, as he did for the previous three, three and a half years. This class, however, is perhaps the most important. There are other classes he gave them. He gave them, for instance, the Sermon on the Mount. It wasn't just to his disciples, it was to everybody. He also gave them just a week or so before this another class, what we would call a class on prophecy, in Matthew 24 and 25, when he talks about the signs of his coming. But this class in particular is a close, intimate class with 12 of his disciples whom he had chosen to be special messengers or apostles. He had a job for them to do. He intended for them to do that job after he left. He himself, as we'll see here in a moment, knew what was coming down. He knew what was happening. In fact, the very first thing we're introduced to in John chapter 13, which is, by the way, where this discourse begins, in John's Gospel, chapter 13, he says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come. Now that's kind of uh, important to understand from John's point of view, who wrote this Gospel frequently throughout the earlier chapters of this gospel, John would make note that Jesus' hour had not yet come. 
For instance, when he turned the water into wine at the wedding feast of Cana, at the request of his mom, she was wanting, of course, him to demonstrate the fact that he was, in fact, the son of God. And she would want some uh, public recognition for all the shame she'd had to bear since she had this child out of wedlock, essentially, legally. And she was wanting to be vindicated by that miracle. But Jesus, in answer to her, did the miracle. He provided. He turned 40 gallons of water into wine. He did the miracle. But he did it to demonstrate the joy he wants to bring into all people's lives. And when his mama pleaded for the show, he said, woman, my hour has not yet come. It's not time. Likewise, his brothers, a little later on, came to him and said, now look, feast is coming up here in Jerusalem. If you are the Christ, like you say you are, if you're the Messiah, then go up to Jerusalem and tell them. Go up to Jerusalem and straighten those boys out up there. All those religious leaders he told his brothers, my hour has not yet come. See, frequently he would say, it's not time, it's not time, it's not time. So when you read in John chapter 13, that Jesus knew that this was his hour. He knew the time had come to do the greatest work he was about to do for all humanity. The greatest work of suffering on the cross, not only to forgive us our sins forensically, but also to make us brand new persons. He knew his hour has come. Let's look also at what else he knew during this time, because we're kind of getting into the mind of Jesus at this point for a very important reason. He says he knew its hour would come that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. That just doesn't mean he loved them all the way through, completing his ministry, but he loved them to the uttermost. So what was involved in his mind on the night before he was crucified? It was divine love for his disciples. He wasn't worried for himself. He knew where he came from, he goes on to say, and he knew where he was going. He wasn't at all concerned about himself. But his love made him concerned about those 12 men that he had chosen and named apostles that he was going to leave here to do a work for him as his ambassadors. And supper being ended, that is the Passover meal that they shared in the upper room, the Jewish feast of Passover being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. See, Jesus knew that as well. He knew that Judas was going to betray him. And we're going to deal with Judas specifically as part of our study here a little later. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. Now, let me give you just a little practical insight into that knowledge that Jesus had. It's the same kind of knowledge we talk about all the time when we say we need to know who we are in Christ. We need to know what God has done for us in Christ we couldn't do for ourselves so that we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are secure in the Father's love. Jesus knew he came from the Father. He was going back to the Father. You can't get any more secure than that. And we need to know who we are in Christ, what God has done for us in Christ, so that we can have this sense of significance as a person. This sense of importance, of meaning and purpose in our life, adequacy. Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands. He was in charge. Now, he demonstrated that on that very night a little later when... The army, the temple guard, 
came with swords and spears and torches into the garden to arrest him. And he asked him, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. He simply said to them, I am. And they all went backwards and fell down. Just declaring his identity as the Son of God was so powerful it knocked military men down to the ground. Jesus knew the Father had given all things in his hands. Now when you know that you are secure in the Father's love and you know that you are significant in his plan, the bottom line is you know you cannot lose. No way. No way can you possibly lose in this world because your needs are met in him. This was the mindset of Jesus as he approached this last training class. This was in his mind. He knew he was okay. He knew he was going to be fine. He knew that what the Father had called him to do, even though it was going to involve agony and suffering, he knew that he was capable. Therefore, he was free to actually care about his disciples, to minister to them. I thought about this a lot. If I were... If I knew that tomorrow I was going to be tacked up on a cross, I would be looking for some place to go tonight, wouldn't you? Besides there. I mean, I'd be squirreling around trying to take care of myself. That wasn't what was in Jesus' mind. His mind was absolute confidence. Confidence in the Father's love for him and the fact that the Father had given him all power into his hands to do this job. Now, with that in mind, Jesus did something very strange. I mean, exceptionally strange. He, being the Son of God, as Peter had declared earlier in their little retreat up at Caesarea Philippi, thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He did something that really shook these guys up. Because these disciples, these 12 men that Jesus had called out, and named them apostles, pointed them as special messengers for Christ. These men were just like us. They weren't any different than we are. They weren't special in the sense, that's why Jesus called them out, because he knew they were special people. Mm -mm. They were just ordinary people like us. You see, God doesn't call and use special people. He doesn't call people that are qualified for the job. What he does instead is qualify the people he chooses. He makes them qualified. He gives them what they need to get the job done. He uses them. They're simply a channel of his power and his will. So Jesus has got these guys they're a lot like us. And they've been following him for about three years. The natural question comes to mind, why? Why would you follow this guy? Leave your family. Leave your job. Leave your homes. And follow this guy all over the countryside, wherever he went. Why would you do that? Well, they did believe. They believed he was a king. He was the king, the Messiah, the king of Israel. But not only did they believe who he was, they believed with all their heart in what he was going to do. Being the king, they believed without any question in their mind whatsoever that he had come to establish the kingdom of Israel here on this earth as prophesied by the Old Testament prophets. They were sure that he was a king. They'd seen him do so many miraculous things. They participated in the, mir in the miracles he did. When he fed the 5,000 men plus their wives and kids, they passed the food out. 
They saw him walk on water. They saw him calm the storms. They saw him heal the sick, cast out demons, heal those plighted with leprosy. They saw all that. They saw him raise the dead. Not just once with Lazarus, but several times. They knew he was the king, and they knew he had the power to establish his kingdom right now. They knew he had the power to throw off the Roman government and establish the kingdom of Israel according to the prophecies of the Old Testament. That's why they followed him. Because when he established his kingdom, they were going to be tight with him. They were going to be in the inner circle. So when he established his kingdom and was recognized by the whole world as the king, guess that what that would make them? Guess what that'd do for them? They'd be right there next to him. So why were they really following him? They were following him to be rich and famous, just like we would. They were following him to get all the goods that they thought they needed to be okay. Because, I mean, he, he could do it, and they knew it. They actually, at this point in time, now this has been going on all throughout, but it really came to a head on this night. They were actually fighting with each other, arguing with each other, trashing each other, throwing each other on the bus to prove one thing. Which one of us is the greatest in the kingdom? Which one of us is going to have the most money, the most power, the most glory, the most fame when the kingdom comes? And they were buying and jockeying for that supreme place. Now, they're not unlike us. They have the same needs we have. And they've been conditioned and trained just like all of us to depend on everything and everyone except God and who he's made us to be to satisfy our needs on a personal as well as a physical level. So these guys weren't any more qualified than we are to do the work Jesus had established for them. But as I said a moment ago, God doesn't choose the qualified. He qualifies the chosen. And so Jesus is beginning to do that right now. That's the whole context of this last ministry training class. It was to qualify them for the work that he had in mind for them to do after he left. So he started out in a very shocking way. After supper was over, he rises from supper in verse 4 and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Now, this is really weird. I mean, this shocked those guys. What are you doing? You're the king. You're the master. You're the Lord. What are you doing acting like a common house slave? What are you doing kneeling down and washing everybody's feet? Kings don't do that. They have other people that do that stuff. That's not the job of the king. The king rules. What are you doing, Jesus? So he didn't understand at first. But he was giving them actually an object lesson, a very important object lesson that serves as the overall context for this class. He was showing them what their life was going to be about. Now, as he began to wash their feet, he came to Peter. Of course, I like Peter. He's one of my favorite apostles because he had a big mouth. There's a guy, I won't mention his name, among us that I'll just use his initials, John Hales. He has a big <laughs> mouth. what he gets for not being here. Reminds me so much of Peter. 
And that mouth was running before his brain was engaged. <laughs> All the time. I call him Brother Mouth. And Peter, when he saw what Jesus was doing, when he saw him lay aside his outer garments and wrap himself with a towel and look like a common house slave, and then fill that basin with water and kneel down and begin to wash the disciples' feet. He said, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. This ain't happening. This can't be happening. In Peter's mind, Jesus wasn't acting like a king. He was acting like a slave. And that didn't fit with what Peter had in mind for Jesus and for himself. Because if Jesus was his Lord and he was a slave, what well, would that make Peter? Lower than a whale's belly, right? So Peter's pride bowed up. When Jesus came to him, Peter said, Oh, no, no. You didn't ever wash my feet. And I like the way he put, You shall never wash my feet. Like he knew something. <laughs> Listen to those superlatives. You always, you never, right? You never wash my feet. Jesus looked at him and warned him. He said, look, Peter, I understand. You don't know what I'm doing now, but soon you'll, you'll know. You'll know about it. So chill out. Well, that wasn't enough for Peter. And so Peter said unto him, you'll never wash my feet. Jesus had to get a little more harsh with him. And he told him point blank a truth that all of us need to take to heart about his ministry to us. He told Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have anything to do with me at all. You don't have any part of my plan, my kingdom, or anything. You have nothing to do with me if I don't wash your feet. Now, that shocked Peter. Knocked his pride down a notch or two, but he recovered. And so he responded to Jesus, okay, I'll play your game. But don't just wash my feet, wash my hands on my head also. Do me better than everybody so I can be the greatest in the kingdom and whatever funny thing you're doing. And then Jesus explained to him, he said, Peter, those who are washed... Literally, that word in the Greek means those who are bathed, those who've had a bath. They don't need to be bathed again. All they need is their feet washed off. And here he's talking about the common practice in those days. People didn't have bathrooms in their houses. And so if you wanted to take a bath, you'd go to the central bathhouse in the city or village. And there you take a bath and get squeaky clean. But when you're walking home, your feet get dirty. And the first thing the house slave did when you walked in the house was to wash your dirty feet off. And you'd be all clean. So when Jesus said, you all are clean. You've been bathed already. But what I need to do is just wash your feet off. They began to wonder, what's he talking about here? They began to realize he's using a metaphor here, washing their feet to explain something else. And then Jesus made this one term, we'll come back to later in our study and talk uh, this one statement. He said, he that is washed or bathed doesn't need to be washed except for his feet. And you are all clean, he said but not all. What? You're all clean, but not all. Now, at first I thought, you're all clean, but you still got dirty feet. But I don't think that's what he was talking about. As John explains in the next verse, he says, for he knew who should betray him. Therefore, said he, you are not all clean. You've not all been bathed. What he was saying as we'll see a little later in our study, perhaps next week, what he was really saying was the beginning of his work with Judas, whom we already know he knew Judas was going to betray him. 
And so he gave special attention to Judas that night, beginning here with the foot washing. You see, I think he had dealt with Peter, washed his feet, and he moved next to Judas. He began to wash Judas' feet when he said, you're all clean. And he looked at Judas in the eye and said, but not all. In other words, he told Judas, I know what you need. I know you're not with me. I know you don't believe who I am and what I'm doing. I already know that. And we'll come back to that a little later. So after he'd washed all their feet, he got up, put on his garments, sat down and said, do you all get the point? Do you understand what I've just done? Do you understand what I've just revealed to you? If I, your Lord and Master, your King, have washed your feet, so also ought you want to wash one another's feet. Then in one of those verily, verily, truly, truly statements. The servant is not greater than his Lord. Neither is he greater than his Master. If I, being your Lord and Master, have done this, you ought to do it one to another. In fact, he goes on to promise, if you know these things and do them, Blessed are you. Happy are you. This is the key to your happiness in life is to do what I've done. Now, let's understand exactly what Jesus did by washing their feet. He wasn't just talking about, and I've been through them, and I've known people that do a foot washing ritual. If you haven't been through one, if you haven't been through one, I suggest you do just to get the experience. But he wasn't just talking about a, a ritual, a religious ritual of some sort, when he was talking about washing our feet. He was talking about doing something that every believer needs every day. You see, when you're bathed, when you trust Jesus as your personal Savior, you're born of the Spirit, you become this brand new person. You're all clean. You're totally bathed. Your sins are washed away. You have a brand new identity. You're holy, without blame before God in love. You're perfect. You're righteous with the righteousness of Christ. That's the new person you are. However, that new person that you are yet lives in the same old body you were born with. And resident within this same old body you were born with is the leftovers of what the old person you were produced. All the conditioning, all the habits, all the beliefs, all the memories, all the experiences, all of that is stored in this body. That's why it's referred to by Paul in Romans as the body of this death. Because it has sin dwelling within it. The leftovers of what you used to be before you became this new person. The Bible simply refers to that with one word. It's called flesh. Now don't confuse it with the physical body. When the Bible talks about the physical body, it's talk, it uses the term flesh and blood. But when it just uses the term flesh, it's talking about an inward nature, a self-centered attitude that was inherited by all people when they were born in the first place. That's why we don't have to teach two-year-olds to be selfish. We don't have to teach them to lie. We have to teach them to lie better. But we don't have to teach them to lie. They do it naturally. Because they inherited that. That nature. That's the nature of the old person. That's why Jesus, when he looked at Nicodemus, and that's all he saw was, said, man, you've got to be born again. You were born once totally dysfunctional, a self-centered idiot. Now you need to be born again, born of the Spirit. But when you're born again, you're still living, nothing happened to your body. When you were born again, there was no change in this body. It remains the same. So all the conditioning, all the memories, all the 
experience you've had as the old person you were is still there. And you get confused in your identity. Because that flesh has a mind of its own. It's called the carnal mind. It's not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. And it's enmity against God. And so, in a sense, you almost feel like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Like Paul described in his relapse testimony in Romans chapter 7, he said, when I want to do what's right, I can't do it. When I want to quit doing what's wrong, I do it anyhow. Sound familiar? Of course it does. That's because the new person you are that wants to do what's right still living in this body that's conditioned to do what's wrong. And you don't have the power to change it. Only God does. Now, this flesh that I'm talking about is what is meant in the metaphor Jesus used as the dirty feet. See, you are clean. You are bathed in the fact that you've been made a new person. However, you've been left here in this sin-cursed world that's falling apart, in these sin-cursed bodies that are falling apart, and you need Jesus to deal with that. You can't deal with it on your own. No human being has the ability to change themselves. That's why self-improvements don't work. The only one that can change you from the inside out is Jesus through his power of his spirit. Now, when he talks about washing our feet, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about sending away that flesh, replacing it, getting rid of it. And it's a continual process, just like washing the disciples' feet illustrated the fact that every day you get out and walk around, your feet are going to get dirty. Well, every day you live as a new person in this fleshly body you've got, you're going to be dirty. You're going to have dirty feet, and you're going to have to have Jesus deal with those dirty feet. That's why I told Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you won't have anything to do with me. So every day we have to trust Jesus to deal with that old sin nature we've got called the flesh that bows up against him and his kingdom and what he plans to do in our lives. But he doesn't stop there. Let's follow through with this metaphor. Not only does Jesus deal with your feet, but one of the cardinal reasons he left you here on this earth was to follow his example. See, when he got back up and he sat down, he got his clothes back on, he sat down, looked like that king again. He said, do you understand what I've done to you? I'm washing your stinking feet as an example of what I want you to do with one another. I want you to help each other deal with their stinking flesh. See, everybody's got it. There isn't anybody that doesn't have it. And nobody's flesh is better than somebody else's flesh, even though we think that way. I think a lot of times, well, my flesh is a lot better than yours. My flesh doesn't stink, right? Yours does. You know what that comparison's like? It's like comparing horse poop to cow poop to dog poop to cat poop to pig poop. Now, I'll admit, you have your preference. We all have our preference. And we consider some to be worse than others, right? Chicken poop. But it's all poop. Every bit of it. I don't care how you dress it up, make it look good. It's poop. Now, everybody's got the flesh. Everybody, all believers, have the flesh. There isn't anybody that doesn't have the flesh. The only time you're going to get rid of that flesh finally, once and for all, is when you die. And you get that new body that's reserved for you in heaven. It has no flesh. It's a spiritual body, just like the resurrection body of Jesus, without any flesh that matches you. But until then, you're going to fight the flesh every single day. Now, I know there's some, some people like to think they've arrived. And they get to thinking, oh, man, I haven't 
freaked out in a certain way for a long time now. I've changed. I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. I behaved myself. And by the time they get to thinking that way, boom, they fall. Relapse. Do that thing they swore they'd never do again. See that flesh takes continual cleansing. It's the same thing that John talks about in 1 John chapter 1. When he says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, that's with God, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice for sin, keeps on cleansing us from all sin. It keeps on. You don't get a once and for all deal. It keeps on cleansing us from all sin. It's continuous, present tense. And he warns in that passage that if we say we have no sin, we don't have dirty feet. Uh, not me, I don't have flesh. We deceive ourselves. And notice he doesn't say we deceive anybody else because everybody else can see right through your religious facade and knows better. But we deceive ourselves into thinking, oh, I got no sin, I got no problem in my life. And the truth's not in us. But if we will confess our sin, if we'll agree with God concerning that nasty flesh we've got and our inability to overcome it, if we'll agree with him, he is faithful, meaning every time, every time you go to him. And he's just. He's fair. Why? Because he already paid the price for it. To send it away. That's what forgiveness means. It means be sent away. So what does God do? He sends away all that fleshly motivation, fear, guilt, and pride. He sends it away. He sends away all that trashy behavior. He sends it away. It changes you. It changes your emotions. It changes your feelings. It changes your thoughts. It changes you from the inside out to look like Christ so that you can be like Christ. He does that continuously through his spirit living in us. Our job, agree with him that we need it. His job, get rid of it. And when he does, he replaces that fear, guilt, and pride with love, joy, and peace. He replaces all that selfish, self-centered behavior with long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. He replaces all our spiritual doubts and confusion with faith, meekness, and self-control. See, the fruit of the Spirit is replacing that fleshly character. How often? Every day. As long as you're walking in this world, you're going to get dirty feet. They're going to have to be taken care of. But it's not just you. Everybody else around you is going to have the dirty feet. So Jesus said, now listen, I've given you an example. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to wash one another's feet just like I've done for you. How in the world are we going to wash one another's feet? What's he talking about here? Well, with regards to the flesh, we wash one another's feet, first of all, by refusing to identify them with their flesh. That's what Paul did in 2 Corinthians 5. He said, from now on, I will recognize no one no human being after the flesh. What do you mean by that? I won't look at you and see your natural identity. I'll see the new person God has made you to be. My exercise of faith will line up with how God sees you as his beloved child and whom he's well pleased, no matter what your stinking flesh has done. I'm going to see you as a new person. When I do, I can recognize that, yeah, you're a new person, and yes, you have filthy feet, dirty feet. 
and you need help. You need those feet washed off. You need to be directed to the Lord to have him wash your feet off. And that's our job. To encourage one another. Not to condemn one another. You see, a lot of people think, especially lately in modern Christianity, a lot of people think that it's the job of the church or the religious people to run around and point out the fact that people have dirty feet. And condemn them. Your job is not to condemn people who have dirty feet. By the way, your feet are just as dirty. Your job is not to condemn them. Your job is to confront them with the idea of restoring them. Your job to believe that's not who you are. When you start believing the truth of the gospel as it applies to other people, you begin the process of washing their feet. And as the Spirit works in you, leads you, you're going to do one of two things with it. You're either going to join God in forgiving them of their dirty feet and let them go, which most, most of the time that's what he's going to tell you to do. You're going to spot somebody with dirty feet and he's going to say, forgive them and go about your business. Or number two, on occasion, there'll be a handful of folks, and only a handful of folks, usually not more than two or three, that you'll see their dirty feet, and God will say, I want you to wash their feet with me. I want you to take the time and energy to confront them about their dirty feet without condemning them. I want you to take the time, energy, and effort to actually tell them and warn them about those dirty feet with a goal in mind of restoring them and washing those feet. And then he'll further lead you. Now, when they receive you, I want you to comfort them because they're going to be emotionally upset and distraught when they cop to their dirty feet. I want you to comfort them. And you comfort them with the same comfort you had, you got, when you had dirty feet. Probably in the same way. Don't worry about it. God will take care of this. And finally, I want you to support them. They're weak in the faith. I want you to hold them up. I know they have a terrible time believing they're worthy. I know they have a terrible time believing they're not their dirty feet but I want you to believe it for them and share it with them you see then you enter into the process of washing one another's feet you actually care about them recognizing the new person they are one simple little phrase covers all of that it's called loving others like Christ we call it the critical event because that's why we're here now, this whole last training class that Jesus gave his disciples, everything he promises, everything he tells them, everything he warns them about, everything he mentions is all within the context of your ability to actually be Christ to others. That's what he's prepared you for. That's why you're still here. That is your purpose in life. You're not here to be all fat, dumb, and happy and go on vacation and have a good time. You're here to be Christ to others. That's your high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And here's the good news. What he's called you to do, he'll qualify you to do. Just like he did these boys. In the same fashion, he did them. So as we study through this last ministry training class, I want you to Take it to heart. Think about Jesus training you, teaching you, showing you, revealing to you what he has promised to do through you for others. You see, the beauty that he tells us about with this example is this is a key to our happiness. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. 
That's a real positive promise. But I don't want to turn it around negatively, but you can. Why are you unhappy? Because you don't know these things. You haven't got a clue of why you're here, and you're still as selfish as you all have been, and you don't really give a rusty rat butt about these things. And you can't figure out why you're unhappy. I'll tell you why you're unhappy. You don't know these things, and you're not doing them. That's why you're unhappy. Oh, no, it can't be that simple. Yeah, it can. The gospel's simple. You receive it by faith. So Jesus said, I've given you the example. Now it's up to you whether you want to follow through or not, whether you want to follow him or not. You don't have any other responsibility besides this one thing that I'm going to leave you with. Your job, as always, in any matter of Christian life, your job comes down to one word. That's faith. To put it quite simply, all you need to do is to say, Lord, that's what I want to do. I want to believe you. That's it. He does everything else. He does it all. Lord, I want to get in your yoke and find your rest. For your yoke is easy. And your burden is light. That's all. You don't have to make it happen. You don't have to cause it to happen. You don't have to continue to make it happen. Your job is just to want to be used. That's all. And trust him to do it. His job, make it happen. His job is the power. Your job, faith. Let's close with prayer. Father God, as we come into your presence here, we thank you for this word that you've given us. We thank you, Father, for the high calling you've given us in your son, Jesus. And even though we might not understand it or know how to live it out, we trust you, Father. Because you've chosen us, we trust you to qualify us, to teach us as only you can do through your spirit. Open the eyes of our heart and our understanding that we might be able to be used by you. To show us how you are using us, even right now, even though we don't know it. And to give us true meaning and purpose in our lives. And the security of knowing that you've loved us. And Lord, we thank you for the promises you've given us. And we look forward to a week of living them out. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Appreciate you all being here. Lord bless you. Have a good week.